his house again tonight. You know, at my age, I could be out at a bar. I could be with friends watching a sports game. Nothing wrong with sports, but it has its time and context. I could be playing video games. Higher? One second. The boss is telling me I need to put this up. Okay. Is that better? Much better? All right. You know, as I was saying, I'm just thankful to be here tonight. There's a lot of different places I could be, but I'm in the house of the Lord. You know, David said, I rejoice gladly when they said, let us go up to the house of the Lord. And I can see why. Those are blessings. So if you will, please turn your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 8. If you're there, just please say amen. All right, starting in verse 11. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin, which means trap, and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Heavenly Father, God, I pray, Lord, at the short period of time we are here gathered tonight, God, that you would just bless this word. Let every word be spoken truthfully, God, and may nothing be taken out of context or against your will. God, put the word into our hearts. Help us to remember it and help us to apply it, God. Help us to be the best Christians we can be. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I want to give some background information about this passage. Isaiah was a prophet to the southern kingdom. Israel at one point split into two different nations. They had a civil war, kind of like we did, except for it actually succeeded, and there was two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now, the northern kingdom was bad from the start. Almost, pretty much every king of the northern kingdom was wicked and done evil in the sight of the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Judah was so-and-so. Sometimes Judah had a good king, sometimes they didn't. But the problem that the Israelites, both the north and the south, fell into was idolatry worship. They followed the gods of the people around them. And so God would send prophets to these people, some to the northern kingdom, some to the southern kingdom. And they would basically tell them, hey, you guys are sinning, you're on your way to hell, you need to turn back to God. Now, sometimes they would listen, and other times they would simply kill the prophets. In fact, if you know the New Testament scripture that says, and some were sawn asunder, it's very probable that that was a reference to Isaiah. It's not written down in the Bible, but tradition is, is that Manasseh, which was Hezekiah's son, had Isaiah literally cut in half. That was how Isaiah died. Not necessarily written down in the Bible, but that gives you some context for how that was. But anyway... Isaiah was a prophet who had a lot to say about how the people were living at this time. Now, these people were going to, we'll just say buildings, but they were going to temples, and they were serving gods by having sexual intercourse outside of marriage. There was harlots, prostitutes everywhere. They would steal each other's land by simply removing landmarkers. Let's say Katie and I lived side by side, and we had a stone that said, this is my part, this is Katie's. Well, I could over time slowly push it back further and further without Katie noticing, and that was a way of stealing land. The rich would actually buy out people's land, which in fact was against what the law had said. The law was the people keep their heritage. God didn't want all this mingling and, and someone getting huge. Well, they did that anyway. They were ba basically almost every sin you can imagine they were committing at this time. It sounds a lot like our country today, if you ask me. I mean, turn on the TV. I was watching a video the other day. I can't go into specifics. I had to turn it off. I couldn't handle it. I was watching a video where they were just openly talking about astrology. It was like, oh, I'm kind of new to astrology, as if it was nothing. My Bible says in the Old Testament that they would be put to death. They wouldn't be coming out on TV in the wall with astrology. But anyway, before I go chasing rabbit holes, I just want to say this. Isaiah was going at a hard time in Israel's point. This was, and this was the southern kingdom of Judah. They were about, 
100 to 200 years away from Babylonian captivity. And the Assyrians were very close to destroying the northern kingdom. So everybody was terrified. The northern kingdom was, everybody was terrified because Assyria was a, not, not only was Assyria a very powerful empire, but they were brutal. The Assyrians would flay people, which means skin people. They would cut off people's skin, and, and people would live for a few days until they died of either shock, hypothermia, or infection. So the Assyrians were very brutal. They would literally cut open pregnant women and take the babies out of them. They were brutal. They weren't, not only were they powerful, they were brutally powerful. And so there was a lot to fear at this time, especially for Isaiah, who was probably somewhat scared that the Assyrians would come into Judah and take over Judah and do to them whatever they do to everyone else. But not only that, but Isaiah was a man who told the Judeans and told the people living in the southern kingdom, hey, we are far from what God told us to be. Instead of following the law, instead of doing the feast that we were supposed to, they had perverted everything. In fact, the Bible says in the earlier of Isaiah that God said this, I hate their new moons. I hate their feast. Why? Because they were celebrating them vainly. That sounds a lot like Christmas to me. We celebrate Christmas every year, don't we? You see on little postcards, for unto us a child is born. How many people have accepted that child? I want you to know that if you are walking in sin, God hates even your prayers. It's the truth. It's what the Bible says. But Isaiah had a lot to fear. But listen to what God said to him. He said, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify or set apart the Lord, regard him as holy. And let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. In other words, Isaiah, I'm telling you exactly what to say. Now you go to these people and you tell them what the Lord says and you fear God. Let him be your dread. And that hit me one time because I was listening the other day to a man who was, he does a Bible commentary. He does an audio Bible commentary. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. His name is uh, Michael Murat, in case anyone's interested. Very good Bible teacher, I will say that. But he, he, was, he was reading this passage and it was literally like God for a moment in time stopped him and just took over that man's body and told me exactly what he said. And I'll tell you, this is, what I, this is what I got from God. He said, Derek, if you're going to be a preacher, your job isn't to make people like you. Your job isn't to water down the word of God. Your job is to tell them exactly what the word of the Lord says. And if they don't agree with it, they can't take it up with you. They can't take it up with Dave J. John, Jamie Fortner, or Charlie Bowden. They can take it up to the God who wrote it. If you believe the Bible is God's word, then you take it up with God if you don't like it. And I felt God said, listen, young preacher, you are responsible. If I tell you to preach my word, you preach my word, and if people don't like you, oh well. And you know what I learned? When I first started to really study the Bible, I would talk to people, and I talk to people who don't necessarily believe in God, and we bring in science. I'm for science. I believe science is a good thing. It doesn't disprove God. Not real science. Science has nothing to do, in a sense, with God, if it's done properly. However, I was probably somewhat more lenient on the scriptures I was sharing. And you know what I learned? That if I water down the word of God, you end up in a worse position than before. You want to know why? Because you know what I learned, Brother Dave? If someone doesn't want to serve the Lord, they're not going to serve the Lord, no matter how you do it. So not only, not only are they still unsaved, but too, you look like a fool, and now you've got some apologizing to do to God. So I felt like God was saying, young preacher, you tell them the word of the Lord. Just as he said to Isaiah, neither fear ye their fear. And another way that can be taken, there's one or two ways this verse can be taken. One way is neither fear ye, ye their fear, saying don't be scared of what they're scared of. Some, some versions will say that. Other versions say this, don't be scared of their threats and don't be afraid. Our jobs as Christians is to tell people what the Bible says clear cut. There is no sugarcoating it. There is no watering it down. My Bible says that the word of the Lord is sure. And if something's sure, it means it will stand forever. 
And if you don't believe me, read in the book of Revelations where it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not. God's word isn't going to change. And in fact, I think in a world that's constantly changing, where you have a new iPhone almost every eight months, you can't even have one, you can't even enjoy something for a year before something new's out, the Bible's really the only thing we have that doesn't change. It's literally, it's the only thing that I don't have to worry about keeping up to date with because it changes. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to read it and stop reading it. No, I plan on reading this the rest of my life or until the Lord comes back. But it doesn't change. Alcohol, alcoholism is still a sin. Homosexuality is still a sin. Gay marriage is a sin and is not accepted in the eyes of God. Gambling is a sin Gossiping, enjoying, arguing is a sin. And many more other things are a sin. And it came to my attention that at a point in time, Billy Graham came to a point where he doubted everything he believed in. He started to doubt. Is this even real? He really didn't know what to do. He, he was kind of in the middle. I mean, he had taught this stuff. I mean, we all know Billy Graham today as a one we would probably consider him like almost a modern-day apostle, but you know what I'm saying, that Billy Graham, we don't see that part of his life. But he came to a point where he was doubting everything. He didn't know which way to go. Do I believe? Do I not believe? But it said he was sitting down near a tree or a tree stump. I don't remember the exact detail. But he just had his Bible laying there. You know what he said, Dave? He started to say, because the Bible says, because the Bible says, because the Bible says, and I want to tell you that there are many things that we need to stand on as Christians because the Bible says. And I think we need a few good men in Congress who will say, this is the way we're going to do it because the Bible says. You know that hogwash about separation of church and state? The reason that was made was to keep the state out of the church. It wasn't to keep the church out of the state. They were scared that the government would try to impose a religion, because England, at the Protestant Reformation, England, the king of England, basically declared himself as the head of the church. And so the United States was terrified that they would do that again. It had nothing to do with the church being involved in a state. And I think it's time that we get some Christians in Congress and the White House to say, because the Bible says and it will be over our dead bodies that it's any other way. Listen, I'm, I'm all for not shoving your beliefs down someone's throat, but I'm telling you something. My Bible says that the nation who forgets the Lord will be turned into hell. There's no other way, folks. There's, there is no tolerance. There is no diplomatic solutions. I want you to know if America does not put God at the top, at as its lead, this nation is going to fade. This nation's going to fade like a flower. You know, Assyria itself, who came into the northern kingdom, Assyria itself ended up losing to the Babylonians. Think about that. If you go and you study the northern kingdom, if you ever heard of the king Ahab, King Ahab was probably the most wicked king that the northern kingdom faced, ever had. Ahab was the husband of Jezebel. I'm sure you know the name Jezebel. That right there ought to tell you something's wrong. If you study that, under Ahab, the northern kingdom was doing well. Economically, they were doing good. They were prospering. All the physical indicators that this country is doing well was there. But you know what? Spiritually, there wasn't even life. And you know what happened? That country was taken over. Assyria came in killed them, destroyed them, and there never has been a northern kingdom since. We've kind of, we kind of see the rise of Samaria, where the Samaritans come from, where they started to have relations with some of the Assyrians, the resettlers, but they never were come back. And I'm telling you, I honestly believe that America is on that path today because the Bible says the nation who forgets the Lord will be turned into hell. However, the Bible also says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. At one point in time, I believe America honestly had it. Listen, I support our military. I love this country. But I think a lot of the reasons America got as good as it did was because there were a few good men praying for this nation. 
by all means, we do have to prepare for war. David himself. In fact, one of the Psalms, it's very possible that one of the Psalms was written as a military cadence. You know how our armies are, are boys now that have this cadence as they're marching? It's very possible that one of those Psalms was made and used in military training. They would sing that as they were doing. But David said this. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, some trust in bows, but we trust in the Lord. Because the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose Lord is the Lord. And now please don't think that I'm trying to preach that America is just going to be turned into hell and we're going to be destroyed. I'm, I'm not saying that because I hate this country. I love this country. If America will turn from its ways, God will heal it. God will bless it. And in a similar sense, we as Christians need to turn to God. It's also an individual thing. This isn't just a national issue. This is a personal, individual problem. The number one issue with America isn't jobs. It isn't military. The number one issue with America is me. Everyone has a me problem. But you know what, Dave? The Bible says to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, might, and strength. And the second commandment, To love your neighbor as yourself. That right there would solve America's problem. I honestly believe that. I I know that. Anyway, I know I wasn't necessarily trying to America. I don't know if God brought that out. That is not what I originally intended, but it's, it's the truth. Because the Bible says, and that's what I stand on. But as I was saying as Christians, our job is to go out and to tell people the word of God. Don't try to water it down. Don't try to say, well, what God really meant. No, God means what he says and says what he means. The Bible says, as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. God knew exactly what he was going to say before he said it because the word of the Lord is sure. The Bible says that whatever pretty much the Lord determines, it's settled and there is no changing. You can hiss, you can howl, you can argue, but the only word you will hear is depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Because the Bible says, unless you are born again, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. Yes, that means a spiritual, there is a spiritual kingdom in our hearts, but there's also a physical kingdom coming. And it's very easy to end the moment to try to get people to like us, that we begin to forget, forget the mandate to tell people the word of the Lord exactly how it is. It's so easy to get caught up in this whole modern day apologetics. If you ever heard of Christian apologetics, basically what it is, it's basically trying to take reason and apply it to faith. I like that. I like being able to defend the faith. I'm for that. But if we're not careful, it gets to the point where we start changing the Bible to kind of meet scientific findings. Like, was the flood really global? Maybe, maybe, maybe what it meant by the world is it meant that world at the time. No. The Bible says it was a worldwide flood, and it was a worldwide flood. And by watering that down, trust me, you're only going to make yourself look more silly to the unbelievers. Because an unbeliever will see that, they'll see you watering it down, and they'll say, well, he's not even sure on his own things. And it will only do us worse, and it will do us good. So go out and tell people the word of God exactly how it is. And make the Lord your fear. Make him your dread. Because it says this, And he shall be for a sanctuary. A sanctuary is a safe haven. That's a safe place. I honestly think at one point in time in America was had a sanctuary because we were with God. And that's, that's why we were how we were. Don't get me wrong. Rainy days come. Wars come, but God brought us through it. Look at our history. Look at World War I. Look at World War II. That's terrifying times in history. If you really study that, World War II is terrifying. I couldn't imagine the fear on some of those boys' hearts they went overseas. Honestly, I mean, I, if I was back in them days, some 20-year-old getting drafted, crying on my shoulder, I would not blame him. I'd be terrified. But look, but look, God brought us through. And I believe that was because there were some good men who honestly, truly served the Lord, prayed. Yes, we had to prepare for war. Yes, we had to do certain things. But we remember the Lord. Where's God at now? Where's God at now? Has God moved or have we moved? We have. We're the problem. 
because we forgot. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And if you forget that, you also forget the part, and he shall be for a sanctuary. But before I go chasing the rabbit hole on that, I want to go, for, go further. It says this, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin or for a trap and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Now, obviously we know this is a reference to Jesus Christ, talking about how Jesus himself was a stone of stumbling. Think about that. Jesus Christ himself was a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. You know why he was? Because the Bible says. That's exactly why he was a stone, because he didn't tickle their ears. Some of the scribes knew. A scribe is someone who writes down stuff, records stuff. So you know what that tells me? Some of those scribes would be rewriting the Old Testament. Think about that. They rewrote the Old Testament. That was their job. Yet they rejected Christ. Apparently, they didn't read the part of letting God be your fear and let him be your dread. But Christ didn't. Christ told them exactly how it was. He told Nicodemus, unless ye be born again, ye shall not enter, ye shall no way enter the kingdom of God. I honestly believe Nicodemus was born again eventually. Look later at the, whenever Jesus was crucified. When they went to bury him, I believe it was his, one of the man's name was Joseph and Nicodemus. Jesus Christ told Nicodemus the word of God exactly how it was. And look what happened. He came, but if you go back, and I'm, I'm, I'm not picking on the disciples or anything, but if you read a certain part, some of the disciples were sent out to rebuke demons, cast demons out. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that they went out with a King James Version Bible and was, and was preaching hellfire hacking, which, by the way, I know I don't always preach like that. I hope that doesn't bother you guys. I preach how God tells me to preach. If God tells me to preach hellfire, I'll preach hellfire. But I, I don't feel God's leading me that way now. And I, I'm not an entertainer. I'm a preacher. I'm an entertainer. I'm, not a, I'm a preacher. I'm not an entertainer. My job isn't to entertain. My job is to feed you. And if I'm up here spitting and hacking and you guys aren't getting anything out of it, there's no point in that. But as I was saying, some of the disciples were sent out to rebuke demons. They were sent into the towns. But there was a certain demon. There were some demons they couldn't cast out. And, it came, and uh, someone came to Jesus and said, your disciples came. And they couldn't cast them out. Now, I'm not saying that those guys were preaching, you know, going through some old psalms and going through some old, the, the Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. I, I don't know what they were doing. But I believe today that if they were out doing that, if they made the, if they made the Lord their fear and their dread, and they went and told that demon the word of the Lord exactly how it was. You better believe that demon's gone. Because if, if wow. You want to know how I know that, Dave? This just came to me. Because in the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes back, it says, A sword shall come out of his mouth and shall devour his enemies. That sword, I believe, is the word. All Je Christ doesn't have to lay a finger on you. You ever think about that back in the old, when he would touch him and heal him? That's a blessing because he didn't have the t just the word of Jesus Christ and you can be healed or killed. Healed or killed. The word of Jesus Christ, you can either enter into the joy of the Lord or you can depart from me. And you can go to the lake of fire where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I can guarantee you at that point there is no deliverance. I don't believe in purgatory. Okay, I'm not trying to preach bad against Catholics, but I don't believe in purgatory. I believe you die, you go to heaven or hell. There's no in between. That's my belief. But that was completely irrelevant. If those disciples, I believe, would have had a good Bible, if they would have been there preaching and spitting. Maybe, I, honestly, I think the, de the demons would have been gone. They wouldn't have watered down the Lord. And you know, there's some other, there's three men I could never compare myself to in terms of bravery. I try to be brave, I try to be courageous, but there's three men. And their name was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, if those boys would be alive today, Dave, I think they would say, because the Bible says... You shall serve the Lord thy God, and him only, him only shall thou serve. You know what they said to old Nebuchadnezzar? However you want to say it, I know there's like a million different ways. I say Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar said, everyone needs to bow down to this, it was a gold calf, it was a golden image, it was a false god is what it was. He had all bowed down, and all other people, even 
the Israelites bowed down, but there was three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, who didn't bow down. And you know what they said? They, they, they didn't say, well, listen, our, our Bible says this. They didn't say, listen, you know, we know you want us to bow down. You want to understand. No, these boys, they got the hint, make the Lord your dread. Him, let him be your fear. They said, we are not careful, O king, in answering you. In other words, there, there's no other option. We don't even have to, we don't have to think about this. It's settled in our hearts. We're not bound down to thy calf because the Bible says, the Lord thy God, him you shall serve, him only shall you serve. And let me tell you something, that, that day they really proved with their actions that that was the only God they were serving. And if they were here today, I think they would look at America, and you know, not just America, but the world, and even the Israelites themselves and say this, throw away the peace talks because the Lord, because the Bible says unto you, and thy seed I will give this land forever as an inheritance. That land, which I, I, I'm really not trying to preach rabbit holes. I'm just going with what, what God tells me. That land, every acre, every piece of dirt where your sole of your feet can touch that ground belongs to Israel. It doesn't belong to the Palestinians. It doesn't belong to anyone in Gaza. These peace talks need to be shredded in half. Because the Bible says, unto thou, you, unto thou and thy seed, I'm going to say it in our words because that's so much easier, unto you and your children, your descendants, I will give this land. My, my. And just to think, for decades, America was trying to bring peace in the Middle East. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says when they talk about peace, oh yeah. The second there is peace in Israel, I'm telling you, the walls are coming in. If I'm alive to see peace in Israel, I'm, I mean, I'm getting ready for the rapture. I mean, that's, that's the way I see it. I'm going to be out in the street corners saying to people, you need to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Because the second they have peace still in, in Israel, it's over, folks. That land belongs to Israel. And they fought for it before. But they won't fight for it now. Because the UN condemns them on everything. Hmm. I think... And like, I'm not trying to, I, I respect Israel. I never want to talk bad about Israel. But I think Israel needs to remember. The Bible says, make the Lord your fear, the Lord your dread. God would, God would destroy any enemy that stood against Israel. They would turn to him with their whole hearts. You know how I know that? Because the Bible says, the Bible tells me of many examples. You ever study about King Og of Bashan, I bet all your life you were told that Goliath was the tallest man in the Bible. No. Study King Og of Bashan. He was maybe about 11 to 12 feet tall. Goliath was 9'9". The Bible says the Israelites utterly, and we're not, well, I'm not talking about partially, we're talking about utterly. Can you guys hear, by the way? Okay. The Israelites utterly destroyed King Algabashan. If someone came through that door 11, 12 feet tall, I'm out of this door. That's terrifying. That is terrifying. I mean, I love like tall people. I like watching play basketball, but 12 feet tall, forget about it. I don't want to watch him. In, I don't want to watch him anywhere. I'm out of this place. They utterly destroyed them. Why? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. There's not a single enemy or foe that can stand against God. And if Israel today, and I know I'm all over the place with this because there's so many applications to this passage. If Israel would make God their fear and it would make the Lord Yahweh, and the King James Version, when that says Lord God, when that's capitalized, L-O-R-D, the actual word is Yahweh. And, it, and to the Jews, that's the name. You don't say Yahweh. I'm sure you heard your song. I'm sure you heard him say Yahweh. To the Jews, you don't say that name. That's the name because it's so holy. But if they would make Yahweh, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, and there's a lot of significance in the God of Abraham, because God is the God of the living. When you say God of Abraham, you're not talking about a past tense. Abraham's alive. God of Jacob, Jacob's alive. The God of David, David's alive. 
But if they would make the Lord God, and I'm talking about a true humbling, would make the Lord their God, I think Israel would just prosper. And they're doing okay now. If you ever haven't noticed how small they are and how powerful they are in the region they're in, Israel's tiny. Look how big Israel now is compared to the rest of the nations. But you better believe no one's going to attack them. Why? Because Israel's got some firepower. And Israel's got the United States. God has still had his hand on Israel. Even, even after all of this, God has had his hand on Israel. But one day they will turn to the Lord their God. The Bible says, Christ says that you won't see me again until you want me. There will be, there will be a day when they'll want, they'll want Jesus. I believe the Antichrist is going to mess them up so bad, Dave. I honestly do. I believe the Antichrist is going to wreck them. And, I, and I'm sorry if I'm keeping anyone too long, but I but there will be a day when Israel will make the Lord their God. He will be their fear. He will be their dread. And the Bible says in the book of Hosea, when he told Gomer to go, when he told Hosea to marry Gomer, which was a prostitute, which was symbolizing God's marriage to Israel, how Israel acted. God was faithful to them, but Israel went and went after every other God you can think of a lot like America today. They had a child. They had had a few children, but one of them was like Lo Ruhama, which was no mercy, for God was no longer going to have mercy on Israel. And the other one was Lo Amai, I believe, Amai, which means not my people. That's big words from God. That's big words. And I I never want to hear those words, Brother Dave. I never want to hear the words, depart from me, you work for every iniquity. That's the, one of the most things I dread. I can get fired from a job. I can get kicked out of Puritan. I could be never allowed to prech anywhere. But those are some words I don't ever want to hear in my life. Well, then, I guess, then ever. But, but if you go on, God says, and in that day, to whom it was said, no mercy, mercy will be shown. To them they said, you are not my people. They will say, you are my God. No, they will say, God will say, I am. You are my people. And they will say, you are our God. So the day will come when Israel, and not just Israel, but the whole church as a whole, will want Jesus. We'll want Christ to come. But until then, our job is to tell others the word of the Lord. Because the Bible says, Go therefore ye into all nations, make, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And just as Nicodemus wasn't won over with Christ, saying, Well, you know, the book of Isaiah says this, but you know, our latest archaeological findings, no. Jesus told him plainly, Unless you are born again, you shall not enter the kingdom of God. Later on, Nicodemus, when Jesus' body, when it was time to be buried, Nicodemus was one of the men who helped. Could you imagine burying a dead body? That sounds awful. But burying the body of God in the flesh? In a sense, that's an honor. Jesus never once watered down the word of God and look what happened later. Those in your life that are unsaved, which I'm pretty sure the people that a lot of the people I know in life, it seems like the majority of them are unsaved than are saved. At school, it's different, but when I'm here at home, it seems like I know more people that's unsaved. And just as I felt God say to me, Preacher, listen here. Your job is to tell others the word, your job is to preach the word how I tell you to do it. Your job is not to make people like you. The same goes to you. Tell people the word of God. They may threaten you. Sometimes you may, you may get hurt. I mean, Isaiah was sawn in half. Paul was beheaded. God himself was crucified on a cross. I mean, that, that's painful stuff. Not, not, not including the cat of nine tails. That's basically a whole bunch of metal that goes into, the back, goes into your back or wherever it lands. And the only way to get those things out is to pull. It's like a band-aid. It just won't come off. The only way is to rip it off. But Christ remembered, and you remember, make the Lord 
Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Fear God, because the Bible says, in fact, Christ himself says, don't fear those who can kill you. You can't do anything after, but fear the one who, after he has killed you, can kill your soul in hell. I believe if I, if I was writing a cross-reference Bible, that I would probably reference those two verses right there. Fear, let him be your fear, let him be your dread in those verses. So I just want to encourage you as you go out this week and whatever you do, fear God and all that you do. When you work, work as if Jesus Christ himself is your co-worker. Work as if Jesus Christ himself is your manager, your boss. When you have the opportunity to tell others about Jesus, tell them exactly how it is. I'm not saying you've got to go and say, you're going to hell. Okay, God does not enjoy sending people to hell. I, will never, I never ever want to preach like that as if God... In, no, God will send people to hell. I've heard it said people send themselves to hell. No, God will send people to hell. If you reject him, God will send you to hell. I want that to be very clear. In fact, it talks about the Lord himself saying... It talks about the Lord separating the sheep from the wolves. To one, he says, enter in the joys of the Lord. The other, he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I'm telling you, they will be carried away with this weeping and gnashing of teeth. God will send you to hell. I want to be very clear on that. But God's will is that none should perish but come to have everlasting life. Tell people that. Tell people about what God is doing in your life. And don't water it down. Don't try to make it sound more appealing because I can guarantee you, if the Spirit of God is not there convicting him, there's nothing you can do. The Bible says, no man, Jesus himself said, no man can come to me unless the Father draws him unto me. If God is there drawing someone to himself, your only job is to tell them what the word of God, what God's done in your life. Don't water it down. Don't get scared if they reject you. Honestly, you'll probably be rejected more. I've worked the job and so sometimes it's kind of like that. You'll be rejected more than you will be accepted. But make the Lord your fear and the Lord your dread. Guys, I love you. I just want to encourage you all. Stand on the word of God. Tell others what God's done in your life. And don't get scared. Listen, it is so easy to get scared. At my age, when I talk to my friends, it's kind of scary. Like, dude, we're 22. We should be out part. We should be doing all this stuff. I don't fear what my friends think at this point. I fear what God thinks. Because I know on that day, on that great and terrible day, the only way I'm going to make it is if my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you won't help anyone else get there if you don't tell them exactly what... You know what? The Word of God, it says in Revelation, as I said earlier, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not. The Word of God is the only truth some people will ever know. Pilate said, What is truth? Thy word, O Lord, is truth. Don't water it down for someone. There's people out there who need truth. There's people out there that are addicted to drugs, and drugs is a terrible thing. I have, I do, I have sympathy for people with drugs. I'm not saying I endorse or encourage drugs. I do not. But I have sympathy, because I know it will get a hold of someone. Don't rob them of that. <laughs> Don't rob some people of knowing the only truth they will ever know in this life. And that's the word of God. Don't be scared what they think. It's better for them to be mad at you and make it to heaven than for them to be your best friend and burn in hell. And what's, what's the second greatest commandment Jesus says? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now it says, love thy neighbor self, but love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you love yourself enough to read the word of God and take it as it is, love your neighbor enough to tell them the truth and exactly what it says. Because if you love your neighbor, you'll want them to go to heaven. And I'm telling you, the best way to do it is, is to tell them the truth. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them nothing else. Tell them about Jesus. I want to pray for you as we close. I hope someone got something out of this tonight. I really do. I really do. Sometimes, you know, I feel like, oh, you know, in my mind I'll have this hellfire revival preaching, and then I come up and it's kind of slow and gentle. But I, I preach the way the Lord tells me to preach. 
There may, there may be days I'll be up here bobbing preaching hellfire. But the, here's the thing. I'm not an entertainer. I'm called to preach the word of God and nothing but. Paul says, I want to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. And that's all I want to tell people. I don't want to be up here hacking and preaching, get a whole bunch of friends and tell them how my ministry and how God's just doing great things in my life. And I'm just so thankful. Yes, I'm, it's an honor to be here. My job is to tell you the word of the Lord. And so I hope someone, someone, even if it's just me, I hope someone got something out of this tonight. Because the word of God is truth and the word of the Lord is sure. His testimonies, all they're settled forever. Tell others that. Tell them the truth. Stand on truth. Don't water it down. Be honest. And if they hate you, just remember they killed the prophets and killed Jesus Christ himself. Dave, would you like to come up? We're going to get a song or just pray. Whatever you guys would like to do, whatever the Spirit leads.